Well, this morning we're going to look at the three temptations that every person faces. Uh, three temptations that every man, woman, boy, and girl on the planet Earth has faced since the beginning of time. And uh, so temptation is, is man's oldest problem. It's, it's been man's problem since the Garden of Eden. Uh, it's as old as Adam and Eve, and it's without a doubt you and I's number one problem as well. I mean, we, just think about it. If you and I were never tempted, we'd never sin, right? And if we never sinned, we'd always be in perfect fellowship with God. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about temptation. Excited about this message to share with you. The Old Testament begins with the temptation of Adam and Eve in Genesis 4. And then in uh, the New Testament, it begins with the temptation of Jesus in, in Luke 4 or Matthew 4. They're in both. Uh, and we'll look at both of those stories here in a moment. Now, uh, this is very important. You might want to write it down. If you're new in the Lord, you need to understand this, that it is not a sin to be tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. All of us are tempted, um, even Jesus. Um, and a lot of people go around with a lot of false guilt, I think, thinking, oh, I should have never had that thought come into my mind, or I should be beyond that. No, you'll never be beyond that. Uh, what's what's the, the key here is that you don't let it dwell. Uh, it's a sin to give in to temptation, but it's not, it's, it's not a sin to be tempted. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, and yet he did not sin. Now, Jesus experienced maximum temptation. I mean, if Satan had had any stronger temptations, believe me, he would have tried using them on Jesus. Uh, the only good thing we can say about Satan is he is, he is entirely predictable. Uh, what I'm proposing to you today is that Satan really only has three fundamental temptations, kind of broad temptations, to try to use against you. Uh, the three same temptations that he used against Adam and Eve in the garden, the same three temptations that he used against Jesus in the desert are still the very same three temptations he still uses on you and, you and me every day. So there, he doesn't have any new temptations. Our text this morning is in 1 John 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 16. But before we read that, I want us to go up a verse and look at the verse before that in verse 15. John 2, 15 says, Do not love the world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Now, this is the Apostle John writing and saying these words, love not the world. And by the way, it's the same guy who wrote John 3.16, God so loved the world. So here he is saying, love not the world, don't love the world. And then he says, God loves the world. And you're kind of like, well, that sounds like a contradiction. So which one is it, right? Uh, well, in John 3, 16, he says, God so loved the world. He's talking about the people of the world. God loves the people of the world. And, and did you know that God has never made a person that he didn't love? And some of you need to hear that. It's here this morning or listening online today. I've heard some Christians say, my problem is I just don't love Jesus enough. That's not your problem. Your, your biggest problem is that you don't realize how much Jesus loves you. Because if you understood how much he loves, if you felt how much Jesus loves you, you couldn't help but love him more and make him uh, the Lord of your life. I mean, it's, it's just... Uh, the Bible says, we love because he first loved us. And, uh, and the biggest breakthrough that you will ever have in your life, spiritually, is the day you finally understand and embrace how much, how very much, God loves you and uh, cares about you in every detail of your life. If you get that, then everything else will begin to fall into place. You know, the Bible says that God God's love for you is unconditional. In other words, God loves you on your good days, and he loves you on your not very good days, on your bad days. 
He loves you when you think you deserve it, and he loves you when you don't deserve it. You think you don't deserve it. God loves you when you feel it, and he loves you when you don't feel it. Uh, you can't make God stop loving you. And I'll tell you why. Because God's love is not based on who you are, but on who he is. Uh, his love is not based on what you've done, but on what he has already done for you on the cross. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will, shall not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. So again, the same author who wrote God so loved the world says, love not the world. And here in John 3.16, he's talking about how God loves the people of this world. In John, uh, 1 John 15, he's talking about how we're not to love the value system of this world. We're not to love the value system of the world. So what is this value system in, the world, in this world that we're not supposed to be loving? Well, look with me at our text in 1 John 2, 16. For every, let's, let's read it together, one voice, you ready? For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So you've got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the world's value system, and that's the three fundamental temptations that Satan has in his arsenal bag he wants to use against you every day. And God says we're to love the people of this world, and we're to hate the value system of this world. Now, you know what the problem is? The problem is we often do just the opposite. We hate the people of this world, and we love the value system of the world. And we often hate anyone who thinks different than us, or votes different than us, or acts different than us, and then we end up loving the things of this world, you know? And so we become just as materialistic as the world, we become just as sensual as the world, and just as prideful and arrogant and self-centered as the world. And the Bible says that we need to be on guard against three, these three common temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So what does those mean? What do those three mean? Let's break it down together. What is the lust of the flesh? Well, the lust of the flesh is the temptation to feel, all right? I want to feel pleasure. I want to, whatever makes me feel good, you know? Uh, the lust of the flesh is a temptation to feel. Let's look at the lust of the eyes. What does that mean? Well, the lust of the eyes is the temptation to have. You know, I see it, I want it, all right? And you can get sucked right into the world's value system real quick in this Christmas season if you're not careful. I mean, it becomes all about a season of getting rather than giving. And so, um, thirdly there, what, what is the pride of life? Well, the pride of life is the temptation to be liked, uh, to be noticed, to be popular, uh, to be number one, to be envied, okay? And actually to be God. Uh, the lust of the flesh is the desire to indulge. I mean, it can be an addiction to anything. It can be indulging to anything, you know? It could be an addiction to sex and most most of us would think, okay, it's just sex. No, it's not just sex. I mean, it can be pornography or whatever, but it's also food, it's drugs, it could be social media, it could be sports, it could be gaming, it could be television. The lust of the flesh is the temptation to indulge. And then the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is a desire to increase, uh, to amass possessions. Uh, it, it's greed, right? And where the pride of life is a desire to impress, to get attention. Pride of life says, look at me. Put the focus on me. I want to be noticed. You've got the lust of the flesh. It involves uh, passion. The lust of the eyes is possession. And then the pride of life is, involves position. So you've got passion, possessions, and position. They've got the P's going on there, all right? And then you've got the S's here. The lust of the flesh is about senses. The lust of the eyes is about security. And then the lust, or the pride of life is about success. 
the lust of the flesh is all about the appetite. You know, it's, it's kind of like the, the ad, uh, obey your thirst, you know. The lust of the eyes is, is uh, adverse. It's about greed. And it's, it's the illusion that just having more is going to make me feel more secure. It's going to fill that empty void. It's, it's that illusion of more. And then there's the pride of life, which is ambition. Okay? Um, lust of the flesh, you get sex. Lust of the eyes, salary. Pride of life, success. So you got sex, salary, and, su- uh, and success. And so the lust of the flesh, if you go to philosophy class, they'll teach you and tell you that's called hedonism. All right? Pleasure is number one emphasis in my life. Hedonism. I just want to be happy. Ever heard everybody say, I just want to be happy. That's my goal in life. All right? Lust of the eyes, that's called materialism. And the number one emphasis on life here is the acquisition of things. I'm all about materialism and acquiring, you know. The pride of life, that's called secularism, or what we call secular humanism. And, uh, and secular humanism says, well, I don't need to worship God. In fact, I'd rather have people worship me. You know, I want to be God. Uh, I want to be noticed. I want to be admired. And uh, I just say this, if that's, if that's your thought pattern, if you're, if you're the center of your universe and you don't have a big enough reason to get up in the morning, all right, for, so, uh, so there's the lust of the flesh, which challenges the sufficiency of God. You know, I don't believe that God will provide for me, so I've got to get it myself. So the lust of the flesh is, challenges the sufficiency of God. Then there's the lust of the eyes that challenges the sanctity of God. And this is where I put things in the position where only God should be. It's what we call uh, an idol in our life. And things uh, should never uh, be put in front of God and become an idol. The Bible says we should never allow anything to be first in our lives that would ever compete uh, or our affection for God. And then you got the pride of life, and that challenges the sovereignty of God. Um, I'm, I'm going to do with my life what I want. Don't anybody tell me what, what to do or try to, and I don't need anybody, including God, telling me what to do. I'm my own boss. That's challenging the sovereignty of God. Now, these are the three uh, common temptations known to man. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And every single, uh, every single advertisement is built on one of these three temptations. Have you noticed that? Uh, and some of them cover all three at once in the, on the advertisement. Get our product and you'll feel great. You know, get our product and you will have it all. Or get our product and you'll be envied, you know? And all these things that the world is trying uh, to get us to get, the Bible says we're not to live for those things. Don't chase after the things that your neighbor's chasing after. We're to love the people of this world and we're to hate the value system of this world. So the, the three temptations that, that we just talked about You'll see that all through Scripture when it starts with Adam and Eve and goes on to Jesus' uh, temptation in the desert. Let's look at those two together. Uh, Genesis 3, 6. Go back to the Genesis story. Adam and Eve. The woman saw that the tree had fruit that was good to eat, nice to look at, and desirable for making someone wise. You'll see the three in there. The first temptation, Satan said to Eve, look how good this fruit looks. The tree had fruit that was good to eat. What temptation is that? That's the lust of the flesh, right? It tasted good. It's pleasurable. It felt good. It was fun. How many of you know sin is fun? Now, now come on. Somebody get honest like this guy down here just because you're in church. How many of you know sin is fun? Yeah, nobody would be doing it if it wasn't fun, right? But here's the catch. The Bible says sin is fun, but it's only for a season. 
And the problem with sin is it's short-term gain with a long-term loss. So you better count the cost. Uh, the next phrase says the fruit was nice to look at. Is nice to look at. And the, and the New Inter International Version says it was pleasing to the eye. I see it, I want it, and, and of course what temptation is this? This is the lust of the eye. And then that last phrase there in verse 6 says, desirable for making someone wise. That's the temptation uh, Satan is saying, if you just eat this fruit, it'll make you wise. If you eat, just eat this fruit, you'll be like God. What temptation is that? That's the pride of life. Have you ever noticed, it's interesting, have you ever noticed Satan never tempts you to be like him? <laughs> I mean, he never says, do this and be like me. No, he's not that dumb, all right? He says, do this and you'll be your own God. You'll become God, you know? So the three temptations um, of Adam and Eve are the same three temptations that uh, Jesus experienced in the desert. Let's look at that story. Jesus being tempted in the desert. Uh, you can look at Luke 4. <laughs> I had them in James last service. And they're all going, where's this at in James? And uh, you can also find it in Matthew. But it's uh, Luke 4, um, beginning with there, verse 3. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. You say, well, what's wrong with Jesus being hungry? Nothing. I mean, he'd been fasting 40 days, 40 nights. There's nothing wrong with Jesus being hungry. So what's the temptation here? Well, the temptation is to use your gifts to satisfy your own flesh, which is the lust of the flesh. Uh, the temptation for you and I will always be to take the ability that God has given you and I and just use it for our own benefit and not to glorify God and to help others. Satan doesn't mind if you succeed in life as long as you take all the credit and, and, and the benefits accrue to you. So the first temptation is to take the gifts that you've been given and just use them uh, to glorify yourself. The next temptation there in verse uh, 5 it says, Then the devil took Jesus up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He shows Jesus all the wealth of the world. And Satan says, All these things I'll give you if you'll just worship me. If you'll just one time worship me. This was the temptation he was giving Jesus. Uh, and what temptation is this? It's the lust of the eyes. I see it. I want it. It's, it's materialism, right? The big temptation for you and I, as long as we will breathe here on earth, will always be to love money. You know, Jesus said you can't love both God and money. And the temptation here is for you and I to always sell out and allow money to become an idol in our life and to put it in, 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 a, in a place that it should never be. I mean, money is just neutral. And we can use it for good, or we can, uh, or it can be like my precious, you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, the next temptation in verse 9 says, Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you're the Son of God, jump off. <laughs> if, if you're really God, is what he's saying, prove it. Like, you're God, the angels aren't going to let you fall. They'll catch you, and it'll, it'll be a really cool show. Everyone will be impressed with your miracle, and everybody will know that you're God, and everybody will worship you. And so you're sitting there wondering, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with Jesus being worshipped as God? Nothing, because he is God, right? So what's the problem? Well, Jesus knew that he was to be worshipped because of his death on the cross, not for showing off his glory by giving everybody a big show, all right? This is a temptation that you and I will always deal with as long as we're breathing, sucking air here on earth, the temptation to show off, to get people to look at what we, we've done. All your life, you're going to be tempted to show off. Now, I want to spend uh, our remaining minutes looking at the antidote 
to these three temptations in life uh, and how we can overcome, we can defeat temptation, find victory in our lives. It's interesting when it comes to dealing with temptation, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? Uh, I'll give you the bad news first. All right, here, here's the bad news. The bad news is you and I were never going to outgrow temptation. It doesn't matter how spiritually mature you become in the Lord, you're always going to deal with temptation for the rest of your life. Because verse 13 in this passage that I've been reading says, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Uh, and I wish that verse wasn't in there, but it is. It would be nice if we could just go, okay, I, got, I, I, I handled that test. I'm done with that the rest of my life. That's not the way it works. Fact is, you and I, we're going to be tempted the rest of our lives uh, until we get to heaven. You'll never get so strong that you don't have to worry about, oh, this is not going to bother me anymore. In fact, the more you grow in the Lord, the more you become like Christ, and the bigger difference you make in this world, the more Satan is going to hate you, and the more he wants to fight you, and the more he's going to try to take you down. But you don't have to fear that. Uh, here's the good news. You know, um, temptation can be an opportunity not just to do bad, but to do good. It can, it can be an opportunity to grow. Have you thought about that? I mean, it's kind of natural to think that temptation is an opportunity to do bad, but it's also an opportunity to do good. And if I'm tempted to be unfaithful and I choose faithfulness, guess what? I've just grown. And so, uh, what are the three antidotes to temptation? Well, let's write these down. Uh, it's, it's the same ones every time. The antidote of the three big temptations is integrity, generosity, and humility. Integrity, generosity, and humility. I forgot to tell you to open your app. I don't think you're writing them down. All right. Uh, if you want God's blessing on your life, if you want God's power, the power of God on your life, if you want his anointing on your life, you must build your life on these three character qualities, integrity, generosity, and humility. And, and some of you are like, Mark, why these particular three qualities? What makes building my life on these three qualities the antidote? Well, let's break it down together. First of all, the lust of the flesh is a temptation to indulge in pleasure, right? Well, the antidote to the lust of the flesh is integrity. It can only be integrity because the word integrity means wholeness, wholeness of character. It means wholeness of character is what makes men and women resist the lust of the flesh. Uh, the important thing here to remember is that nothing in my life is to ever become compartmentalized. You know, it's kind of like, I'm never to be, okay, this is my life at church, and this is my life over here uh, at work, and then this is my life here in my marriage, this is my life here when I'm with the guys on Friday night. They ought to all look alike. They can't be compartmentalized. Uh, they're, they're, they can't be uh, segmented. Uh, it's got to be genuine. It's got to be real. It's got to be authentic. What you see is what you get. I'm the same everywhere I go or who I'm with. Uh, I'm the exact same person with my buddies on Friday night as I am here on Sunday with you. I'm the same person here with you, and I'm the same person when I'm by myself all alone. That's integrity. Integrity means to be authentic. It means to be genuine, to be real. <laughs> it's funny to me that every generation thinks that they thought up authenticity. You know, every new generation comes up, yeah, uh, we're just, we're the authentic ones, you know. The, the truth is, that's ne there's never been a generation that's like phonies, right? Every generation wants people to be real and integrity uh, for the Christ follower, uh, the Bible says, means to live a blameless life, a blameless life, like the life of Job. And that doesn't mean perfect. Job wasn't perfect. God's not looking for perfection, but he's looking for somebody who's real and transparent and honest 
and uh, honest about their weaknesses and honest about their sin. And okay, Second uh, Chronicles sixteen nine. Check this out. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the world, throughout the earth, to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. There's that word blameless. God is looking for people with integrity. And if he will find these three characteristics that I'm, I'm talking about, integrity, generosity, and humility, if, if you'll get usable, he will wear you out. <laughs> he will. And the only qualification is that you would be a, a man or a woman or boy or girl who walks in integrity, a blameless life, and you live a generous life, and that you uh, are humble, and he will wear you out. Let's look at, uh, well, number two, the antidote to the lust of the eyes is generosity. And I'm going to skip number two, generosity, and come back to it at the end, because we're giving an offering at the end, and that kind of goes together, okay? So let's, uh, let's go to number three, and I'll come back. Number three, the antidote to pride of life is humility. Humility. The pride of life is the desire to have status. It's the desire to be envied by others. And of course, the only antidote to pride is what? It's humility. You say, what is humility? I think a lot of people think humility means going around, putting yourself down, saying, I'm no good, I can't do anything. That's not humility. That's false humility. Uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Does that make sense? Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And there's a difference. Humility is not thinking of you, humility is thinking about others first. In fact, Philippians 2, it says, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to others. And again, that's just the opposite of what our culture teaches us, the world's system. Um, our culture teaches us, say, hey, how, how do I look? I'm, I'm in front of everybody, how am I looking? Have, have I got stuff on me here? Am I look okay? Do I look cool? You know, people are, are you thinking about me? That's, that's the world system. Um, I love Toby Max speak life quotes, and this one hit home as um, uh, one of our staff put it up this week, and I thought, oh, let's show that. One of the greatest prison people live in is the fear of what other people think. Isn't that true? A humble person learns to put their focus on others rather than themselves. And one of the best ways that you and I can do that is we would train our mind and humble ourselves is every time that you walk into a room of people, if you'll make this a habit, every time you walk into a room of people in it, Instead of thinking, hey, how do I look? Am I okay being self-conscious? Instead of that, focus on others, on how you can encourage them, how you can encourage someone maybe who is discouraged, how you can speak life into somebody else in that room. Put your focus on them. And that'll, that'll change your life, and you'll become what the Bible says, humble, like Jesus. Humility is not denying your strengths. Humility is being honest about your weaknesses. And you and I are both infinitely valuable and we are infinitely flawed. You missed a good opportunity for an amen there. We're all flawed, right? But the good news is that Jesus, and God, he still uses flawed people. And it's a good thing he does because nobody would ever get used by God. A humble person has learned to continually depend upon God. There's a phrase there. I'd like you to think about to depend upon God continually. This is the heart of humility. Humility, in essence, is expressing our dependence upon Him. You know, on the, uh, every day to get up and just whisper a prayer. I, I, I did it all the way to church today. I said, God, I ask, give me guidance today. Help me to speak your words because my words aren't going to have an eternal difference on people today. Let me speak your words. 
Help give me wisdom and understanding for my day. Help impart your power in my life. Anoint me so I can make a difference in the world around me. That's a dependence upon God in our everyday life, and that's humility. And that is the key to humility. Okay? Well, as we go on, the antidotes to these three big temptations are integrity, humility. Let's go back to number two, generosity. The lust of the eyes is a temptation to be greedy, you know, to feed this materialism um, that the world says buy into. The only antidote to the lust of the eyes is generosity. You know, everything in this world teaches us and the world system is to get. Give me, give me, give me, give me. You know, I want more, more, more. That's materialism, the world's value system. The temptation for all of us, for you and I, is to sell out and to love money. Okay? And again, Jesus said back in Matthew 6, he said, you cannot serve God and money. You can't serve God and money. He didn't say you should not. He says you cannot. What is the opposite of getting? Giving. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. You've heard me say it many times if you've been around Brandy Wine. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And the act of worship in itself is giving our lives over to him. If he, if he gets all of us, then the rest just follows, you know? It's kind of like, well, it's not my life anyway. It's not my possessions. It's none of it's mine. It's all his. He's Lord. Every time you give, you become more like Jesus. Every time you give, your heart grows bigger. Every time you give, every time you help someone in need, or every time you're generous, you break the grip of materialism on your life. And every time you give, like in a special offering that we're going to do, uh, we do this annual giving to Christ once a year, because we don't give many offerings around here. Uh, we give a lot away all year round, but not very many offerings uh, that are just special like this, which is going to help some great things. I mean, the women's recovery at Talitha Combe, uh, help families who are struggling financially with, uh, get my directions over here, with uh, uh, J.B. Stevens and just bless all those over there. Christmas is supposed to be about Jesus' birthday, not us, right? And yet sometimes he's the one that gets left out when it comes to the gift giving. So that is why over the past decade, our church family here at Brandywine has made it our mission to begin our first gift each Christmas with a gift directly to Christ himself, all right? And it's an annual tradition here uh, for our church called Giving to Christ at Christmas. And this year's offering, we're splitting it three different ways to go out. Uh, as I mentioned, Talitha Combe Recovery House to help support women who are courageously pursuing freedom and addiction. And it's our hope that this gift will remind those ladies that they are created and called and loved by God. Amen. J.B. Stevens there, the elementary school to help support several families that are struggling financially. And we're gonna give them groceries and different hygiene supplies, to carry them through this season. And also we want to bless every teacher over there, every staff, every administrator with a gift of appreciation for the love and care they give to our students. Won't that be fun to be able to bless them? And then finally your gift will thirdly go to support the heart of our mission here to reach people who are far from God and a strategic investment will also be made toward the ongoing needs of our campus as we continue to fulfill Christ's mission to the world. So this is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So I just want to encourage you to give cheerfully, give uh, generously, give sacrificially, not out of ab obligation of any sort, not out of pressure. I mean, this is between you and God. This is an expression of worship, you know? 
out of a heart of worship, give. So just like the three wise men who came on that first Christmas morn, bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, it was worth a lot of money, and they, they bowed down, they found the Christ child, they bowed down, and, and they gave as an act of worship. So as we sing, we're going to be, uh, that's an act of worship, but as you give each Sunday, that is an act of worship too. So we're going to sing, Here I Am to Worship, in closing, and after we sing, uh, as we dismiss, we're going to give as an act of worship, or giving to Christ a Christmas offering. There are, there are several ways to give, like uh, Pastor Paul mentioned. There's big black buckets all over the, the auditorium today because they're big, because we know the offering is going to be big. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, they're there in the tunnels as you go out. You can give cash, you can give a check, right, to giving to Christ for Christmas and bless those in our community. And you can give online, you can give a text, there's a number up there to give, or you can give at a kiosk out there. There's a, there's a, a place to give there for giving to Christ as well. Just a reminder, uh, make sure this gift, if you're a regular giver, uh, make sure it's a gift above and beyond your regular gifts because we want to finish strong in the year here in December for our regular budget needs. And, uh, but if this is the first time you've ever given, Man, don't worry about that. Just give, and, and uh, God will help you as you grow in your habit of generosity um, and to defeat materialism in your life. Let's pray together. Would you bow your head with me? Would, Father God, thank you for demonstrating what real love is to each and every one of us as we're in this Christmas season. You loved us so much that you gave your only son to come and die for our sins that we might be forgiven so that we could live a different life and not a life of bondage and materialism and, and pride and all the things we just talked about, but an abundant life, a freedom. So today is an act of worship out of love. God, I surrender my life completely to you. Just tell him, come and take over, God. I make my life an offering to you. I give you permission to use my life any time, any way you choose for your purposes. God, I'm yours. You didn't hold back on the cross. I don't want to hold back to you. You are my Lord and my God. And God, I pray that you'd help me to grow in, in integrity, that there would be wholeness and character within my life. I pray that you'd help me to be transparent as a person, to be genuine, to be authentic, I pray that you'd help me to live a humble life. Help me to value others above myself. Not just care about me, but to others. The focus wouldn't be on me, but it would be on others. And how I can speak life into somebody else and help somebody else. Uh, help me depend upon you daily to guide my life, to give wisdom, to fill me with your spirit and your power. And God, I pray that you'd help break the grip of materialism in my life through helping me to live generously. Let that just be a lifestyle in my life, God. Just, just say, God, do a work in my heart. I want to be a good steward of the resources that you've entrusted to me. Help me to use your money to do good. It's not mine anyway. It's all yours to do good in this world. So today, we give our first gift this Christmas directly to you as an act of worship. We love you, God. To tell you that, and we pray that this offering would be a blessing to help make a difference in the world around us in an act of worship. It says that we love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand and let's sing and worship, and then afterwards we will do an act of worship and giving.